homes of people living in insecure private rented accommodation. We finally managed to get a bill through yesterday to require that all private rented homes are fit for human habitation. My goodness. It's good to get it through and well done Labour MP Karen Buck on getting it through. But it is a pretty big indictment on modern Britain that it relies on a private member's bill to get something so basic through Parliament at this time. But well done her on achieving that. And a Labour Council that would achieve those things. Later on today I'll be in my constituency this afternoon where we've got a Labour Council working really hard for the people of my borough. And I'm so proud I'm going to be there to open a new community centre with 32 council flats attached to it. That's a Labour Council working with the community to improve community facilities and housing. It can be done. It can be done even with a Tory government, but it can be done even more with a Labour government that would give the resources and the opportunities to councils to build the housing that we need. We're going to build half a million council houses during the first parliament of a Labour government. Those houses will be of good standard, energy efficient, secure, lifetime affordable tenancies, and it transforms the lives of children and families. Anyone that's been to meet a family that's been rehoused after years and years of insecurity will realise just how, what a difference it makes to them. The family works together better, the children achieve better in school, the health is better, we're all better off as a result of it. And that huge building programme, and it is a huge building programme, will in turn create jobs all through the supply chain and in the industry. And that means we've got to tackle the skill shortage. It means we've got to train more building workers, more electricians, more plumbers, more carpenters. We've got to train more people. The skill shortage is ridiculous. It's up to us to invest in the education of all young people. That's why a Labour government will end fees in colleges, universities and for adult education. And yes, I know this is expensive and we discussed it and debated it and costed it very, very carefully. But we're quite clear that it's absolutely right to raise the level of corporate taxation to 26%. It is absolutely right to end the taxes, evasion, scams and rip-offs, which the Paradise Papers have shown, in order to properly fund our public services. 95% of the population will pay no more in tax. 5% will be asked to pay more. And I say to the very rich people who uh, may well complain and some of their uh, accomplices in our national media that may decide to have a go at me because of what we're putting forward on this, I simply say this. One day, all of us hopefully get old. One day, any of us could have a heart attack, could have a stroke, our home could catch fire, we could be involved in an accident in the road. At that point, we need an A&E department. At that point, we need a fire service. At that point, we need a police service to help us get through the vi being a victim of a crime or an accident. Taxation is a moral down payment for the good of the rest of society. And that is what we are going to be saying and doing as a Labour government. Today is one of our campaigning days. And um, I'm very determined that our party should be out there campaigning at all times. We organised 600 events on the National Campaign Day, the last one we held. This day, I don't know what the total number is, but it's running into the many hundreds all over the country. As people are out knocking on doors and campaigning, getting ready, yes, for local election campaigns in many parts of the country, but also getting a message out about the National Health Service. On December the 20th, the Prime Minister, in answer to a question from me, said, and I quote in Parliament, and I quote what she said was, the NHS is better prepared for winter cri this winter crisis than at any other time. <laughs> wow. Good thing it was a recess coming up that day, wasn't it? Because there was no PMQs then for a couple of three weeks. And uh, what happened? I was speaking to... Uh, health workers in Lincoln on Thursday 
who had been working very long shifts, tending patients in the hospital car park because of the backup of ambulances, looking after people in desperate stress, having to discharge patients early from the hospital in order to make a bed space for somebody that was in even greater need, making some very difficult and very tough judgments in hospitals all over the country. We thank all NHS workers for all that they do. The incredible dedication to public service of ambulance workers, nurses and doctors and so many others. Fantastic what they do. But the pressure they're under is extraordinary. They need our support. And when Sarah and I spent the day or half a day talking to um, a lot of people who work in the NHS, all of them said they wanted to work in the NHS. Those that had been... Um, privatised within the NHS, wanted to come back into NHS employment. And I believe an NHS ought to be exactly that, a national health service, publicly paid for, publicly employed and publicly accountable. Not an opportunity for Virgin Healthcare to take over service after service around the country and get their hundreds of millions of pounds worth of contracts. This Thursday we're holding a national rally at Central Hall Westminster, the Methodist Central Hall in Parliament Square in um, celebration of the NHS but in, ter in determination to defend it. And we'll be holding it in exactly the same place that the Labour Party organised a huge rally in July 1945 to celebrate the election result that elected that Labour government and Clement Attlee, as Prime Minister, then dedicated that government to the cause of establishing a National Health Service. We'll be celebrating and, and campaigning to defend it and to extend it into a National Social Care Service and to have a mental health service that's properly funded and available at all times for all people of all ages and end the stigma surrounding mental health and support people through a crisis, not make unpleasant remarks and jokes about that. And during the, and during the year, we'll be organising many other events, not least a big event in Tredegar in South Wales in Anaran Bevan's former constituency at the stones that are his memorial as our dedication to our National Health Service. Today is about the National Health Service and what we can achieve by it. But there is a big political lesson that's come out this week and that was the collapse of Carillion. This is a company that had been very easily getting large numbers of uh, public contracts that has many PFI contracts in schools and in hospitals, many road building and rail contracts. It issued three profit warnings over the past few months. The government ignored them and carried on giving contracts to them. They then went deeper and deeper into collapse and they finally collapsed completely, leaving debts of almost two billion pounds either to suppliers and subcontractors or a pension fund deficit and total assets of £29 million. And so there's obviously a huge gap there. Who's paying the price of this? Is it the chief executive and the directors? Or is it those that worked on Carillion contracts who have not been paid and so many contracts are now being stopped because there's nobody prepared to do the work because they're not confident of being paid. The building of the new hospital in Liverpool has stopped and a number of other places as well. In this crisis, the best Theresa May could offer in Parliament was to say the government is a customer of Carillion just like anybody else. It seems to me a fundamental misunderstanding of the role of public office and government. We're not a customer we're a government, a government that's there to govern and legislate for all the people and take responsibility for a crisis, not walk away from it and assume it's somebody else's. It was her government that didn't have the due diligence to follow that company, didn't appoint a Crown agent to watch what was going on in that company. And the price is being paid for by those that have not been paid, those that have lost their jobs, and are now spiralling out of control as subcontract after sub subcontract after sub sub subcontract is closed down and people all over the country are closing small businesses and losing jobs as a result. 
It requires a serious government intervention to protect those jobs and ensure that work carries on. The serious government intervention is sadly very lacking in this. I tell you, John McDonnell as Chancellor, John Trickett as Cabinet Office Minister responsible for uh, public procurement, they wouldn't walk away and leave it to the private sector to sort it out. They would intervene to protect those jobs, protect those contracts and ensure that we got the benefit of them. But it's also surely a message about the privatisation and service, uh, service opt-out <coughs> culture that's developed in this country. I have said that we would bring PFIs back in-house, that we would end the privatisation culture in public services. The preference has to be public service, public employment and public delivery. That is what a Labour government would deliver. And if there's ever a question as to the efficiency of this, I simply ask them to look at East Coast Main Line. I travel on East Coast Main Line a lot. I have done for very many years. The trains to Newcastle and to Edinburgh, they're wonderful. And the um, work done by the train staff is wonderful. And you look at those trains, they were made by British Rail Engineering. They were publicly designed by British Rail Engineering. And they've been repainted many, many times and refurbished many, many times. But three things are the same. The track is the same, the trains are the same, and the staff is the same. It's just the repainting shows who has got the contract for that period. Virgin got itself a franchise to run the East Coast Main Line, and it was a backloaded franchise in which the majority of the money had to be paid into the Exchequer in the last two years of the franchise. So what have they done? Decided to call it in early, saving themselves £2 billion of payments to the public. When East Coast Main Line was publicly run, we made a profit out of it. The service was good, we made a profit out of it, it was a publicly run service. Reprivatised yet again. I tell you what, a Labour government would not do that. We would bring it back into public ownership and public administration for the benefit of everyone. <clears throat> because it's time we recognised what the value of public service actually is. And so when we go into these election campaigns, as we did in the general election, we're challenging a society that... Um, apparently accepts the idea that the richest 5% of the population will get richer and richer, that the gap between the richest and poorest will grow forevermore, that somehow or other the austerity that's been imposed on us since 2010 will be paid for by local council workers, by the loss of local services, by frozen pay for teachers, nurses and so many others and that the tax cuts at the top end will continue and the charges at the other end will go up and up. What kind of country do we want to live in? What kind of world do we want to live in? One where we read in the Daily Mail about the joys of being obscenely rich and living in a tax haven and making a great profit at the expense of the rest of us, or instead a society where we laud those who deliver for us Nurses, care workers, cleaners, working in the public sector. Those that want to achieve things for all of us. We can do it. We can win. When we entered the general election campaign, all those experts didn't give us a prayer. They said the Labour Party's finished. It's the end. It's the end of Labour, the end of the party. And the newspapers went into hyperdrive. Indeed, the Daily Mail excelled itself with 14 pages of attacks on me on the day before the general election. Well, it didn't really work, did it? And uh, our campaign, our enthusiasm, our determination, and the belief, the self-belief of our supporters and members to go out there and campaign made the difference. The social media campaign made the difference. The way in which young people responded to the campaign made the difference. The two million new voters made the difference. And we got our vote up to 
the highest national vote since 2001, biggest vote in England since 1970, and the biggest swing to Labour since 1945. My only regret is we didn't do even more campaign meetings. I only did 100. Next time I'm going to do many more. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, we didn't quite win the election, but we take it to them. We take it to the Tories, we take it to those that wanted glory in this inequality and injustice in society. We bring people together in hope, in determination to achieve things. And that's what we're going to do today. When we go out campaigning later on, I'm sure the rain's going to stop. We've, Phil has already agreed that the rain's going to stop, so Phil is always right, so it must stop. And we'll go out there to get support to win a Labour Council in Swindon. But I just want to finish with um, a, a message from a young man. When we were <clears throat> outside here before I um, came in to speak to you, I was talking to a young man called Joel. He's 12. Joel is 12 and he's supposed to be at a drama class this morning, but I think he's here. And um, Joel wanted to give a message to me. And he said, young people should understand that politics matters to them. If they want a school, if they want a health service, if they want training, if they want a job, politics matters to them. Joel is age 12. Joel gets it. Joel will make a great contribution to our society. So for Joel, and for the older people that need help and support and care, for those that are worried about their job and their future, those homeless people that are worried how they're going to survive the next 24 hours, and those people who are just concerned about what kind of world is going to be for their children. Come together. Come together under the Labour umbrella. Come together in our great movement. Come together for something different and something better. Let's elect a Labour council here in Swindon. Let's elect a Labour MP. After all, I was born in Chippenham. I'm a moonraker. So please do it for that reason as well. And show that optimism will always triumph over pessimism. That justice will always triumph over greed and injustice and inequality. That's the Labour way. That's what brings us together. Thank you for all you do for our party and thank you for being here today.
it's wonderful the amount of people we've got here so i just want to thank you all for coming we're going to do a photo in just a moment i want to do another big round of applause please for jeremy and for kate or whatever you can do. There are leaflets in bags that, that do need to be picked up and delivered. Whatever you can give, all matters. So please do, uh, to, please do give as much as you can. Thank you so much. The photo, I believe...